Obviously, my brother's visiting from Texas. I love family time. We had one of those extended neat times last night with Mary and I and, and Dana and Sam, our daughter and son-in-law, and Justice and the new baby about to be here in a few weeks. And it was just great, great time together. And like all family times, we do what Sutherlands always do. We tell a few jokes. We make fun of each other. We laugh about, do you remember the time we did this? It's a celebration. It's a very upbeat awesome moments. But once in a while in those family times, there's also a moment that's serious. There's a moment that's somber. There's a moment when we remember back to something significant, when we focus on one of the things that really makes us family. That's pretty much the way we do it here at Westside. We'll go through an entire series, keeping it upbeat, keeping it light, celebrating all that God's doing. It's what we've been doing in this series called Know God. We've been talking about that you can know Jesus, that you can know that he is God. We celebrated that, that he is creator, that he is all of these things. But today, we're also going to focus on the somber and the serious as we get for communion today. We'll explain more about that as we go, but we're talking about Jesus being the Lamb of God today. It's going to be an awesome time of celebration. I'm Dan Sutherland, one of the pastors here at Westside. Welcome you to be with us today. Grab your notes and wave them at me. Whether you're at Lenexa or up at our location at Legends or up at Lansing or in a lot of other places on the Internet, we encourage you to write things down. It helps it stick in your mind, catch in your heart, and show up in your life. That's what we are about. We are in the last week of this series on Know Jesus. And here's the big idea. Most of you have got it down by memory by now. It is this. Knowing about Jesus is not the same as knowing him. You can know a lot about him and not know him. You can know the information. You can know the Bible stories. You can know the history. You can even know a lot of things about church, about religion, and not know Jesus. Billy Graham talks about the fact you can miss heaven by 18 inches by the difference in what you know in your mind and what you practice in your heart because knowing about and knowing are two different things. When you got married, you knew about your spouse. But when you got married, you knew your spouse. Beforehand, it was about, it was information. Afterwards, it's the real deal. Same thing in knowing Jesus. And we've been celebrating a lot of things about him. Fill these in your notes just as a reminder. They're also on the wall. Jesus is God. We talked about the first week. He's not sub-God. He's not sort of God. He's not part of God. He's God. Father, Son, Spirit, all God. It's a mystery we don't fully understand, but it's one that we totally accept because the Scripture's clear about it. He's also the creator. The Bible says God spoke the world into existence, and Jesus is the word of God. He's the force of creation. He's the light. Maybe one of the strongest teachings in this series that Pastor Brian did for us, where he talked about Jesus being the light for our lives and how that works. He's the incarnation, my favorite, God with skin on. He is our ability to see God and know God because he is God with skin on. He's the giver of life. You remember in that week we talked about he's not just the giver of life, he's also the gift of life. Jesus is all of that and more. He's the revelation. If you want to know God, you got to know Jesus. That's why he came so that we could know who God is. Last week, a lot of fun talking about Jesus is the Messiah. It's the idea we all need saving from our sin. That's a one-time thing that God does. And we all need saving from ourselves. That's a lifetime thing that God does. And just because you got this one doesn't mean you got this one yet. We all still need Jesus. We're all still sinners. We all still struggle. Today, The absolute unique one to me of all eight. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Now, when you're looking at that list, you're going, he's God, he's creator, he's Messiah, he's light. He's a lamb? He's a lamb, really? I mean, is that like one of those stuffed lambs? 
you know, like you put in your, in your baby's crib and hopefully they'll go to sleep a little better or, or have a little comfort? Is it sort of like that? Or is it like one of those little lambs that you feed at the petting zoo? Is that the idea? He's the lamb. This is the most Jewish, agricultural, absolute, had to be there at that time to get it examples in this whole list. So we're going to unpack today exactly what that means. There's one verse we're looking at. It's John chapter 1, verse 29. We've been hearing what God has said about Jesus We've been hearing what John the Baptist has been saying about Jesus, but in the first public title given to Jesus, the first one where it's spoken out loud, listen to what John the Baptist says when he sees Jesus come down to be baptized. He says, look, look there, behold, it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We need to unpack an Old Testament background, a New Testament meaning, and then move with purpose into communion today to fully grab what it means for Jesus to be the Lamb of God. I want you to write down a sort of big word, and then we'll unpack it a little bit. The Old Testament word that describes this process is atonement. Atonement. Would you write that word down? It's not just a King James word. It's in most of the translations of the Scripture in the Old Testament. And literally, atonement is the Old Testament word for making things right. Making things right. That's what it means. In fact, I want to show you an easy way to remember what atonement is. We're going to break that word into three words. Put a backslash between the T and the 1, and then put another backslash between the first E and the M. Did you get it? Atonement literally means at one meant. That's what it is. It means to be at one with God. It means to be made right with God, to atone. That's what it means when you atone with your wife or your husband. What do you do? You go back and you make things right. This is called better do it every day. Because when it piles up and becomes big, have you noticed it's harder to do when you've been carrying weeks or months worth of that kind of stuff? We get in a habit where we don't do it at all. It means to make things right. Here's how this works. God created us male and female, put us in a perfect environment, and we had relationship with him. Adam, Eve, God, everything cool. God gives them one rule. Hey, guys, there's a hundred things for you to play with here. Don't touch this. Now, if you have any two-year-old in a room with a hundred toys, and you say you can play with these hundred toys, but don't touch this, and daddy and mama leave the room, where's the two-year-old going? To the this. That's called sin. That's who we are. We are rebellious. And then what I love is when they get caught, they blame each other. God says, Adam, what would you do? And Adam says, it's this woman you gave me. Men, we've been doing that for years. It never has worked. It never has. And the woman just sat there and said, whatever. It never has worked. It's this struggle. The deal is we had relationship. We broke it through sin. Listen. And God has been moving everything that is possible to get us back in relationship ever since. That's his heart, to make things right. His heart is atonement. You're away from him. His heart's to get you back. You've messed up. His heart is to fix you up. You're broken. His heart is to mend you. You're hurting. His heart is to hold you. He's a God who wants atonement. He wants to make things right. This is the message all the way through the Old Testament. Let's fast forward just a little bit. Part, write this in your notes and then we'll unpack it. Part of the Old Testament Hebrew worship was to bring a lamb as a sin offering in order to do what? In order to get right with God. In order to have atonement, in order to make things right, part of their worship was the offering of a sacrifice. Now, this is important for us to grab to understand that Jesus is the Lamb of God. We're 21st century city people. 
I mean, we're not thinking lamb and agricultural and sacrifice and all of that stuff. What in the world did that mean? Do you remember in Exodus chapter 12, I listed that verse for you at the end of your notes today, that chapter for you to read some this week. God's people have been in Egypt for 400 years. When they first came, when Joseph first took them there, they were the top of society. They were honored because God used Joseph and his brothers to absolutely deliver the land from a famine. And for a while, Jewish folks in Egypt were, wow, top of the food chain. 400 years later, they're at the bottom of the food chain. Racism has kicked in. Prejudice has kicked in. They're the slave laborers. They're the forced workers of Egyptian society. They're slaves. They're absolutely treated horribly. And in that circumstance, God raises up this guy named Moses. Any of y'all see the original movie way back when of the Ten Commandments? Anybody see that one? I mean, Charlton Heston. Yeah, I mean, doubt. He, he had the voice of God. I mean, when that guy spoke, it just sounded like God, didn't it? By the way, he looked pretty good, too, now that I think about it. He's just a stud all the way around. Amazing actor, and he played this part of Moses. And it tells the story fairly accurately, actually, of how Moses is trying to get the Pharaoh to let the Hebrews go back to Israel. Hey, we want to leave. We don't want to be slaves. We don't want to be in forced labor. We want our freedom so we can go back to our land and pursue our God. And at first, the Pharaoh says, sure, I'll go for it. But then he thinks about it and says, I'm not giving up my slave labor. I'm not giving up this, this free work. There's no way. So God uses 10 different plagues. 10 different crises, 10 different disasters to get their attention. Does this sound familiar to anybody? God ever used disaster to get your attention? I mean, you ever lost a job that you shouldn't have lost, and it's God trying to get your attention? Or have you ever had a health crisis? You're going, really? Now? I mean, God's using it to get your attention or a financial struggle or a kid that's never given you a problem and they just take a left turn. God uses a lot of things to get our attention. And in this deal, he uses 10 plagues. They are amazing plagues. First one, he turns all the water in the land into blood. Now, I don't know about you, but when I turn on my faucet and it comes out red, God's got my attention. I'm not calling a plumber. I'm on my knees. Whoa, God, what's going on? And the Pharaoh was too. He says, whoa, I hear you. God must want you to go. You can go. And then he changes his mind. So the second plague is frogs, little bitty frogs everywhere. Frogs in your bed. Think that through. Frogs in your sandwich. Think that through. Frogs in your tea glass. Frogs everywhere. Frogs on your toothbrush. I mean, frogs. I'd be going, uh-uh. Uh, God, is that deal still available? Yeah, I let these people go, and he makes the decision. He changes his mind. The third one is gnats. The, the word here is literally a little bitty bug. In, in South Florida, on the beaches, they call them no see -ums. They're gnats so small you can barely see them, but you can feel them when they bite you. And they just swarm. They come, and it seems like the thousands. I'd be going, I'm ready. He wasn't ready. The next one's flies. Yuck. Flies everywhere. Wow. It's like being in a trash dump all the time with flies just buzzing all around. They still don't get it. Then the livestock start dying. He says, I'm going to start killing off your livestock. That's a pretty big deal in an agricultural society. Pharaoh still didn't get it. Is this familiar? How God tries one thing and another and another and another, and he'll keep trying until he finally gets our attention? I mean, some of us have been going around the mountain of disaster so long, we think it's normal. Might be God. Might be God trying to get our attention. The next one is sick. It's boils, sores. They were all over the body of everybody in the land. Check this out, except the Hebrews. Is that cool? I mean, can you imagine going to the doctor for sores and your doctor has sores? That'd be grody. Pharaoh came across pretty quick one on this one, said, I'll let him go. Then he reneges. He says, no, I'm not going to do it. Hail is the next one. And that's not H-E-L-L. -L, that's H-A-I-L. Hail. 
Literally, this hailstorm that's big enough to kill people if they're caught outdoors in it. The next one is locusts. Think grasshoppers. Everywhere. The next one is darkness for three days. No dark. By the way, people have explained this away as an eclipse. You can't have an eclipse for three days. You know, the sun's up for 12 hours. Get it? Then it goes away. It's an eclipse. It's a God thing. No, it's total darkness. It really is. And then finally, the biggest one. God says, I'm going to kill your firstborn in every house in this land except the house of my people. And the Pharaoh says, don't you threaten me anymore, Moses. You get out of here. I'll kill you next time I see you. And Moses prophesies, oh, you won't see me again. This one's going to get your attention. And the instruction is very specific, and it's very important to understand for this passage. God tells Moses, tell the Hebrews, tonight the death angel is going to visit Egypt, and he's going to pass over every house. And what you've got to do to be protected is take a newborn lamb and sacrifice it and take its blood and paint it across the doorframe of your house. So the death angel will pass over all those who were under the blood of the lamb. Do you see why John calls Jesus the lamb of God? He takes them all the way back in their Hebrew history to their most important moment, their moment of deliverance, their independence day. That's what this was for the Hebrews, the Passover, the lamb. And they're going, oh, yeah, we know about the lamb, but, but this guy's the lamb? This guy's the lamb of God? He's literally connecting it to the Passover itself. That's in the book of Exodus. Then you come along to the next book in the Old Testament, in Leviticus, and by now it's become a regular part of their worship to celebrate with the sacrifice of a lamb. Look at the scripture. When you become aware of your guilt, confess your sin, and then bring to the Lord as a penalty for your sin a female from the flock, either a sheep or a goat. Some of them didn't have sheep. Some of them raised goats, whatever they had. This is a sin offering with which the priest will purify you from your sin, making you their the word right with the Lord that's atonement to be made right at one mint when John says Jesus is the Lamb of God every Hebrew in the area understood what he was saying and we can't fully grab what that means without us understanding it God has always been about making things right between us and him and his number one tool for doing that is is Jesus, the Lamb of God. That's atonement. That's the Old Testament, right in this next word. In the New Testament, the word for making things right is reconciliation. Reconciliation. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew comes translated as atonement. Same idea in the New Testament, but you won't see it as atonement. You'll see it as the word reconciliation. And this word is even more specific. It means put things back. Put things back. One of the funniest books I've ever read and also one of the ones full of the most practical wisdom is written by Robert Fulgham and it's called Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. It is an amazing book. You need to read it. It's light reading. It's fun reading. Everything I ever needed to know I learned in kindergarten. Robert Fulgham. He's got a chapter that says take a nap. And the basis of the chapter is when you're grumpy, nobody likes you, take a nap. <laughs> Kindergartners do it every day. They lay down, they have nap time. They may not go to sleep, but they get still, and they get nice, and they're happier, and everybody likes them better. Take a nap. That's pretty good wisdom. One of the chapters is on share your stuff. Share your stuff. And it basically says this, your stuff ain't your stuff. Your stuff is God's stuff. And if it's God's stuff, you're supposed to share it. Now, if it's your stuff, you won't share it, and that's called an idol. Ouch. Share your stuff. But the chapter I love the most is called Put Things Back. And here's what it says. If you make a mess, clean it up. If you get things out, put them back. If you cause a problem with somebody, you go fix it. Reconciliation says God is working to make things right, and I'm going to do my part by putting 
things back by doing what I need to do to stay right with people and with God. That's literally what reconciliation is. Listen to this passage, Colossians 1. Love this chapter. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. Remember, reconciled, he put things back. He made things right. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled, made things right, put things back, you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Wow. Atonement, being at one with God. Reconciliation, putting things back with God. Making things right with God. How serious is this? I mean, how serious is atonement? How serious is reconciliation? I would argue three points that it is the heart of God. In fact, if you ask me to give you, and I've told you this before, a one-word definition of this book, it would be the word redemption. And another word for that is the word atonement. And another word for that is the word reconciliation. God wants us back. Wow. Wow. What a thought. This book is the story of God putting things back, God making things right, God reaching out to us. How serious is it? I think it's huge. Note these three things. There's an entire book of the Bible devoted to this. It's the book of Leviticus. Now, when you read Leviticus, you're going to go, really? I need all these details about this kind of sacrifice for this and this kind of deal for that. Why is there a whole book of that? Because God's saying, this is a big deal. Making things right matters. Living right with God matters. I can't even live right with people till I'm right with God. And we live at the crossroad of those relationships. How big a deal is it? Check this one out. Jesus gave his life to provide it. That kind of makes it a big deal. It says in Scripture that the plan for Jesus to come and to be slain as the Lamb of God, that plan was actually made, check this out, before the world was created. God already knew. He already knew. He knew we'd fall. He knew we'd blow it. He knew we'd need an example of himself. He knew we'd need to know him. And he knew what it would take to put things back right. And Jesus came for atonement. He came for reconciliation. He came as the Lamb of God. How big a deal is it? I think it's the very heart of God. What does God want in your life? I want you to be one with him. What's he want in your life? He wants to have you back. What's he want? He wants you to put things right. What's he want? He wants you, whatever it takes. That's what we celebrate in communion. Communion is literally mirrored on the Old Testament idea of the Passover. That the lamb and his blood is what spared the people. It's the New Testament idea that it's the lamb of God and his blood that spares us. What is communion? Write it in. It's our reminder that Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Is it awesome to come together as a family and celebrate big what God has done? Yes. For once in a while, it's also okay to celebrate quiet. And to be reminded, God loves me this much. God wants me this much. God went this far to put things back right with me. We're going to celebrate communion in a few moments. Go ahead and put your notes away. Keep that same spirit of reverence going. Let me talk to you about how we do communion here. Some of you, this is your first time at Westside and you're going, wow, wow. We showed up on communion day. What do we do? Well, you participate. 
We believe communion is open to anyone who's trying to follow Jesus. If that's you, you're welcome. Doesn't matter if you're a church member. Doesn't matter if you're denominational uh, background. None of that matters. If you're going after Jesus, we welcome you in communion. We believe that the cracker and the juice that we'll share in a few moments is symbolic of the broken body of Jesus and the spilled blood of Jesus. It's our reminder that he loves us this much. It's our reminder that he's serious about atonement and reconciliation and redemption. We're going to pass the plate and then later the juice. Here's what I'll do. When you pass the plate and get the, the piece of bread, the cracker, hold on to it. We'll take it all at once. I'll give you that direction. And later when the cup is passed, hold on to it as well. And I'll give you that direction also. The men that are going to pass this out are in the red here in a few moments. They're our deacons. They are the pastor servants of this church. They do ministry in some of the coolest ways I've ever seen. And they always help us in the time of communion. There's one thing the scripture says that's important to me always to remind you of. It says, since communion is the symbol of God's effort to be right with us, don't take it lightly. Don't take it when you're not right with God. It's basically what the scripture says. Because if you just flippantly take the symbol of, hey, God went this far to be right with me, and you're not even interested in being right with him, it's just kind of like being flippant toward God. In fact, the scripture says, before you partake and remember, examine your own heart to make sure you're right. So I'm going to give you a moment of silent prayer, and then I'm going to wrap that prayer up before we enter into communion. And the band will come and we'll worship through communion because communion is worship. It's communion with God. And we invite you into that. But in this moment of silent prayer, here's your assignment. Go one-on-one -on -one with God and say, God, I do want to be right with you. Is there anything in the way? Is my obedience up to date? Am I honoring you in my life? Put your finger on it, Lord. Show me before I participate in this communion. Let's enter into that time of prayer together. I'll just give you a moment. Just you go one-on-one -on -one with God all over the room, and then I'll pray for us, and we'll move into our time of communion. Jesus, your direction to us was to celebrate, to remember your sacrifice. And we want to do that today. But Lord, before we do it, we want to examine our own hearts. Show us anything that's in the way, God. Put your finger on any relationship we need to fix, any act we need to give up, any attitude that doesn't honor you. And Lord, as we move toward you in this time, would you meet us in this remembrance? Would you remind us that atonement is a big deal to you? Reconciliation is a big deal to you. Help us celebrate what you've done for us. And this time is our prayer in Christ.